Thank you so much. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. I, I'm very pleased and I very much appreciate that you woke up that early in order to get or to receive some information from a lawyer, which is supposed to be the most boring part of the summer school, I'm quite convinced. So uh, thank you for this. And uh, you, you should get something in return for this. And what you should get from my side uh, in return would be that I will, do, I will make some confessions uh, in the next 60 minutes about me and about my personal life. Um, so the first confession to make is that I was born in 1968, uh, which is long, long, long time ago. Um, and, the, and one of the outcomes um, of this uh, biographical detail is that when I hear PRISM, uh, the first thing that pops up in my mind uh, after Snowden uh, is this here. Does anybody know this? Yeah, indeed. So this is, uh, this is uh, the cover of Pink Floyd, uh, um, and uh, their very, very uh, nice LP, uh, The Dark Side of the Moon. And um, uh, this um, LP was launched in a time when, when uh, I was a kid, right? So this is, this is the, um, the, uh, the historical setting. I, won't, uh, I will talk about, um, and it has something to do with the first film that I would like to show you, if this works here now. Um, yes, I need to bring this somewhere on the screen. Does this work? Yes, it does. So. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification directives for the first time in all history, a garden of pure ideology, where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests of a contradictory force. Our communication of the force is more powerful a weapon than any fleet or army on earth. We are one people, with one will, one resolve, one cause. Themselves to death, and we will bury them with their own confusion. We shall prevail. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh, and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. Okay, uh, so 1984 won't be like 1984 is something like the motto of this uh, presentation here today. And it is important to know that this film... Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary. That this film, uh, does anybody, has anybody ever seen it before? Do you know when this was launched? Yeah. When was it launched? When was it shown? No, uh, actually not really. It was shown in, 19, in December 1983, so quite before 1984. Um, and it was, uh, it was presented just two times uh, on TV. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the event uh, that, it was, um, uh, uh, that it was talking about was uh, the, the launch of the Macintosh. And I would really love to get this away here again now in order to go back to my slides because I want to show you uh, how this machine looked like. So this is the machine, right? This is the machine they are talking about. Um, and and the, the innovations, the important innovations, there were two of them uh, in this machine. The first one was the floppy disk. The other one was the mouse. And 1984 um, is, is not only um, a period when I was a kid and I started to listen to Pink Floyd, and it's not only the period when this machine entered the market, but it's also a period when the German Constitutional Court launched a groundbreak, groundmaking decision in 1983, actually more or less on the same day when this uh, spot on 1984, won't be like 1994, was launched, which is a decision of the German Constitutional Court on, anybody heard of that? Constitu on informational self-determination. So in 1983, the German Constitutional Court found a fundamental right in the German Constitution 
called informational self-determination. In German, informationelle Selbstbestimmung. And I think it's important to understand that this a fundamental right on informational self-determination comes from a period when machines looked like this and when kids like me started to listen uh, to Pink Floyd. So there were very, very, very few personal computers in the market. And the main fear in 1983 or 1984, the main fear this Apple product placement also works with is the state surveillance scenario as it was described by George Orwell in his famous novel, 1984. Does anybody of you know whether the German constitution in 1983, when this constitutional court found this right of informational self-determination, mentioned anything explicitly on data protection or privacy or informational self-determination? Is there anything in the constitution, in the German constitution on this? Or in any other European constitution then? The answer is no, right? There is nothing. So in 1983, there was nothing, nothing in the constitution. Actually, however, the German constitutional court found that in the constitution, right? So they, they, they simply put it into the text. So if you, were a, if you were a judge at the German Constitutional Court in 1983, just imagine, right? And you, you had this scenario in your mind, so this state surveillance scenario, and you wanted to do something against this, and you probably would need to find a fundamental right somewhere in the Constitution which is not explicitly written there. And where could you find this? in 1983. Which constitutional right could be the basis for this right to informational self-determination? Or let's put, the, let's put the question differently. Who of you knows Article 1 of the German Constitution? Indeed, human dignity. Die Würde des Menschen ist unantastbar. Human dignity is untouchable or may not be, may under any circumstances never ever be violated. So the, the story, the history of German interpretation of privacy starts in 1983. So in this period, mainly driven by the German Constitutional Court and driven by Article 1 of the German Constitution, which is about human dignity. And it's very important to know that human dignity is, is the only, I repeat, the only fundamental right that may not be limited in European readings, at least. Right? This is the reason, this is the only reason why torture is under no circumstances never ever legal in Europe because torture always violates human dignity and there are no circumstances thinkable under which a violation of human dignity may be allowed. This is very different. I don't know whether you, you saw this video from Donald Trump yesterday. Did anybody see this about waterboarding? He gave an interview yesterday, Donald Trump, about waterboarding. So if you haven't seen it, Google it in the afternoon because it's very impressive. So he gives an interview about waterboarding, and what he says about waterboarding is that it's just, I quote him literally, that it's just peanuts compared to what happens in the world somewhere about terror and violence and blah, 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 blah. So it's just peanuts. That would be completely unthinkable for a European because it is seen as torture, and torture violates human dignity, and human dignity may not be violated under any circumstances. So there is probably no starting point in a given jurisdiction that might be of higher importance than human dignity when you start to build up an argument. So this is, this is the, the, ap the maximum weapon you can use, right? It's, it's, it's the bazooka. And this is, this is the starting point for, uh, for data protection uh, in, in Europe. 
And the reason why uh, the German Constitutional Court found this looked like this. It was just a very simple form, right? It was a very simple form. Um, and uh, what, uh, th that form had, uh, the, had the, the thought behind it that the state wanted to collect information about uh, its population uh, in a kind of public census. And a public census is a very, very old thing. You even find it in the Bible, right? So Jesus was born because of a public census in a different place than his parents lived. So it's nothing really new. What was new in 1983 or 1981 when this whole debate started was that computers were used, right? So it was the first public census where the, the man on the street or the woman on the street realized, okay, this is not only paper, we start with paper, but it ends up in a machine and something, something weird happens in the machine, something possibly dangerous happens in the machine because what might happen would be some kind of state surveillance and that might affect human dignity. And since then, since 1983 or 1981, this tradition, this German tradition of informational self-determination, human dignity, privacy, made its way into the European Constitution. So what you see here now is the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is much younger than the German Constitution. This comes from 2000, came into, forth, came into force in 2010. And again, this European Constitution, Charter on Fundamental Rights, starts with human dignity. Right? So Article 1 again says, Human dignity is unviolable. It must be respected and protected. Full stop, period. No limit, right? That's it. Different from 1983, in 2000, when this came into uh, the world, we now do have a specific article dealing with data protection. Actually, we even have two articles. Article 7, which is about respect of private and family life, and then Article 8, which is about protection of personal data. And this is probably, this is the, the only text you need to read when you want to understand European data protection law in its essence. It's Article 8 of the Charter on Fundamental Rights in Europe. Because what it says on the one, first thing it says is everyone, everyone has the right to the protection of personal data concerning him or her. And this is already an important difference, for example, to the American understanding of a lot of privacy law, because in the US, many laws make a basic distinction between US citizens and non-US citizens, which is one of the basic things uh, the, the Snowden revelations are about, right? Europe, no, everyone. No difference whether you are European or non-European. If you are in Europe, you're protected by this fundamental right. You're protected if it's personal data. The problem now, okay, no, let's start with the solution. Th that's easy. If, if there is personal data, there is protection. If there is no personal data, there is no protection. The problem now is, what is personal data, right? And to, to, to make a long story short, I don't know. I don't know. The only thing I know is, okay, there is, there is a legal explanation saying personal data needs to be connected with a person who is identifiable. Identifiability means personal information, means protection. That was easy in 1983 because there were very few computers and there was not much information on that form, right? So it was quite easy to say, okay, there is a name, a name indicates a person, Therefore, it's personal. In a scenario that we have today, where machines start to communicate with each other, where computers are everywhere, blah, 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 you know all this better than I do, this distinction is going to be more and more difficult to make. So this is one of the challenges we face today, and I would really love to hear from you how we should deal with this challenge, because it's, uh, this distinction is still written into the law. So, and then there are some principles in paragraph two, right? So there must be a fair processing, 
It must be a purpose-related processing, and there needs to be some kind of informed consent in many cases. If there is no consent, then um, you need to have a law, and all these laws need to protect consumer rights, user rights. And finally, there needs to be an, an authority dealing with all this. This is also a rather important point to make uh, in, in Europe, that it's not only you or me being in charge of controlling our privacy rights, but that there's always also an independent authority. And that is also rather weird, because normally we are not protected in our day-to-day -day lives by independent authorities. Right? I mean, if I, go, if I walk on the street, no independent authority checks whether I'm properly protected without any reason to look into this in more detail. In data protection, and this is again something which has to do with the starting point, 1983, and all these dangerous scenarios then, there are authorities dealing with this. So that's all what you need to know. And to make it even shorter, this is data protection in 20 seconds. 20 seconds of European data protection go like this. The processing of personal data is illegal. Please repeat, right? The processing of personal data is illegal. And there are just two exemptions in Europe. Either there is informed consent, or there is a law explicitly indicating that in this very special case, which is an exemption, there may be uh, a limitation of this fundamental right being connected with human dignity of informational self-determination. OK, so this was my world. This is my youth, right? You live in a different world, and you have a different youth. Your youth looks like this. Prism looks like this today, right? No longer Pink Floyd, now it's Katy Perry. Probably you are too old for Katy Perry already, but my children are in this age. And computers no, and forms no longer look like this, right? Your, your life is dominated by some trends um, that look different from my world. My world is the Commodore C64 world, right? Those, uh, those computers. Yours are uh, dominated probably by trends like this one. Everything is going to the cloud. Everything is mobile. Everything is big. Everything is, in a way, social, right? And they are probably even, uh, you can even uh, condensate this further and say, okay, there's more and more available for free, and there's more and more loss of control of all these machines. Who knows how the machines work, right? When I, when I started, the idea was I can open that machine, I can see how it works, I can program it, and I'm in control of it. Right? Many people today no longer are in this position. Probably most people no longer are in this position. And there is this saying, you all know this, if the product is for free, you are the product. So the question then is, where is the problem? What do people like me do then when they look into this new world today? And I, want, I would like to use the next 30 minutes to show you two or three or four, let's see, of the problems we are facing today, at least in my view, when it comes to privacy. Um, so the saying, 1984, won't be like named 1984, is actually very true. The world looks very different today. And the, the question now is how the law that started in 1983 to deal with a situation like 1984 reacted on this changes, change in, in, in the world, in the environment. And this is my personal lesson learned. And I like you to be provoked by this because it indeed is provocative. So my lesson learned is the law simply failed, right? We have a non-working legal situation when it comes to this new scenario. And we have a, a cycle that constantly repeats itself when it comes to legal regulation of this new world in a way. And the cycle always starts with Something new is developed. Something enters the market. Can be the PC, can be the mobile phone, can be Facebook, can be Snapchat whatsoever, right? Something which is important enters the market. 
And the law is always behind that. We are always in delay because law always needs to react on something. Law is very poor in steering something and monitoring something before it is there. We are much better in reacting, but we are always in delay. Therefore, we are too late. And then it's unclear what really happens, right? Who really understood that, the, that uh, what, what Steve Jobs did when he launched the tablet, right? Or w when he launched the iPhone, or when we saw the first Facebook posting, who really understood what that would mean, right? So the situation is unclear and is complex, and it's a very, very quick and speedy development that then happens, right? So Facebook explodes, right? People, everybody wants to have an iPhone. Millions of items are sold. Um, then finally the law reacts, but as it's too late, it's getting more and more irrelevant because the market is already mature and uh, the law is constantly fragmented. I mean, this is a typical answer you receive from every lawyer. Well, it depends. So this is, this is law studies in 20 seconds, right? Law studies in 20 seconds go like this. You can become a lawyer in 20 seconds by simply answering any legal question by one of three possible answers. First one is, it's very complex. The second one is, it depends. And the third one is, there is no decision out yet, right? So this is 95% of my expertise. The last 5% are, I will call you back, okay? So, uh, <laughs> uh, so that's it, right? So, and this is perfectly true for, 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 this, for IT in particular because it's so complex, it's so speedy, and it's so fragmented that there is no lawyer out there knowing the answer, right? It's always one of the three options that I mentioned. We, we are very good in hiding this by, uh, by uh, generating all kinds of new laws and, or, or new rights, um, but the, the deficit is evident. So for one example here. Um, who have you ever heard about the right to be forgotten? Okay, most of you, great, okay. So let's, let, I mean, there are plenty of interesting questions in this. The first one is, is there really a right to be forgotten? Do I have a right? So, I mean, this is, this is filmed here at the moment, right? There are 30 people sitting here in the room, each of you listening to me, each of me seeing me here. I'm a kind of a public figure at the moment, right? I have the privilege and the burden that I speak and you listen. And I'm filmed. Do I have a right that this should be forgotten? I mean, could I really ask that this film should be deleted? Could I ask you to forget what you hear here? And why should I have this right? I mean, this is, this is already a very fundamental question that I will not stress too much today. I will stress another thing, which, is, which has to do with this article. The Europeans came up with this right to be forgotten about eight years ago or so. It was an idea then. And American, um, American authors, privacy authors, started to think about that. And this is an article written in a famous uh, law journal from an American author on this newly um, developed European idea of the right to be forgotten. And the very first sentence of this article goes like this, Europeans have a long tradition of declaring abstract privacy rights in theory that they fail to enforce in practice. So this is the 1984, won't be like 1984 story in a nutshell. Europeans have a long tradition of declaring abstract privacy rights. It's in our constitution. It's quite in detail in our constitution, however, we, at least according to this author, fail to enforce this in practice due to reasons I very, very briefly mentioned before. So let's have a closer look into this right to be forgotten using one case. Um, this is another person of my youth. Uh, probably you are too young to know her. Do you know her? Indeed, that's Barbara Streisand. And Barbara Streisand is famous for an effect uh, that is called the Streisand effect. Ever heard of that? Who can explain to me what that means, the Streisand effect, please? You want to hide something and because of that it has become even more public. Indeed, right. So Mrs. Streisand wanted to hide something. She wanted to hide um, uh, the, uh, an image of her house. 
that was part of a scientific, the picture was part of a scientific project that had nothing to do with Barbara Streisand and had nothing to do with the house. It was more about the shore where this house is placed. And uh, Mrs. Streisand launched a suit, uh, a suit um, the, the, uh, the person running the scientific project. And the outcome of this was that hundreds or thousands of stories and pictures about this house were distributed on the internet. So this is the Streisand effect. And the Streisand effect is, of course, in a kind of uh, tension with an idea like the right to be forgotten. And I want to show you this by one example. This is the, the decision of the European Court of Justice from 2014, where the European Court of Justice finally found this right to be forgotten in the existing legal framework. It's a decision by the European Court of Justice, which is the highest court we have in the European Union, so it's a very important court. And it's a very important decision because, um, because the defendant in this case was Google. So Google was on the one side, right? And on the other side, there was a university professor, Fanny Lee Love, Fanny Lee Love, called uh, Mr. Gonzalez, a Spanish university professor. Does anybody of you know the facts of the case? Do you know what this was about? So Gonzalez versus Google in the right to be forgotten case? Nobody? Okay, so let me tell you the story. Mr. Gonzalez was a university professor, and somewhere in the late 90s, early 21st century, he had some personal financial issues so that he nearly ran into a bankrupt, bankruptcy case. And there was a tiny little article about this that was legally published in a local Spanish journal about this university professor having financial issues, possibly running into bankruptcy. He did not run into bankruptcy. However, this article was available for everybody who Googled Mr. Gonzalez's name. So when you Googled Mr. Gonzalez, one of the very early hits that you received was a link to the story, 10-year-old story, 10 years old story, that he had a financial problem. And what Mr. Gonzalez now wanted to receive was a judgment where Google was asked to delete the link. Right? So no more entry in the Google database. He could not successfully sue the journal that had published that article because the publication of that article was perfectly legal. It was perfectly legal under, under Spanish law to publish that article. So he did not sue the journal, he sued Google. Delete the link, I want to be forgotten because remembering me means Googling me. And the Streisand effect now looks like this. If you Google Mr. Gonzalez today, it looks like this, right? This is, this is the image search of Google. So Mr. Gonzalez will make it into the legal history of the 21st century. He will be unforgettable for being successful in claiming his right to be forgotten. Right? So this is a rather ironic thing in a way because he succeeded, he won the case. Right? So Mr. Gonzalez won the case. The European Court of Justice ended with the opinion that Mr. Gonzalez had a right to be forgotten because Google had violated his rights coming out of Article 7 and Article 8 of the Constitution. So his right to privacy and protection of personal life personal and family life. So I ask you for your gut feeling. Who follows, who buys the argument of the European Court of Justice? Who is of the opinion here in the room that Mr. Gonzalez should have such a right to be forgotten? Who supports this? Okay, so it's about 10 people. Who says that Mr. Gonzalez should not have such a right? Okay. Yeah. 
Yes. Which could be important to someone. But okay. Okay, so you are ruining my joke in a way because the third question would have been, it depends, and I would have then been the person to raise my hand, right? So uh, I completely fall, I buy your argument. Yes, it very much depends, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. So it, it, things. Yeah. Well, okay. So everyone should have a right to be to get entries deleted from Google. That's what you say. Not everybody. Not everybody. If there's a legitimate case, okay, and who should decide on whether there is a legitimate case? The court. The court. Okay. So then, uh, so then let's 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 think about that a little bit more in detail. Okay. So there might be cases where there is a legitimate interest that might legitimately legitimately ask for Google, that Google should delete something. The problem now is, the problem is now is that that's another actually that's another. LP you should see. The problem is in the machine, right? Welcome to the machine, another Pink Floyd album that I would like to recommend to you. Because what happened then is that since this decision of the European Court of Justice in the Gonzalez case was launched, Google had received only in Germany and only in two years. So this is only Germany. It's not all Europe, right? It's just Germany. In two years, 1.5 million requests for uh, search entries to be deleted. 1.5 million requests affecting, uh, uh, sorry, 1.5 million URLs um, affected uh, by such requests in two years. And to, to, to make this a little bit more uh, understandable, this large figure to you, this means that they receive six requests per minute I've been talking now for about 30 minutes, so that means about 1,000 requests since I started, or no, 200, no, 36, uh, about 200 requests since I started this uh, presentation uh, were received by Google, and 550,000 URLs were deleted since um, this decision of the court two years ago which makes about two deleted URLs in Germany every minute. About 60 deleted URLs since I started my presentation. So what happens now as an outcome of this case is that every minute two search entries in Google's Germany's um, index are, del are deleted. And you may multiply this with 27 or 28 jurisdictions in Europe. So it's a huge amount of information that is deleted after this decision in Europe. And let's make a guess. How many people work for the German legal department at Google? What would you think? Legal department of Google Germany, how many full-time staff members? Good, yeah, it's, a, it's two and a half, right? So two and a half people, and they deal with everything. Every, and Google is really in the center of any legal claim you might think about, so they are not really that interested into data protection only, right? So this is just a stupid detail. They are more interested in, in uh, antitrust and unfair competition and all these really dangerous and, and uh, financially um, risky parts of Google's day-to-day um, -day life. Data protection is a tiny detail. So it's not them dealing with those requests. It's a machine or a paralegal and a machine. It's, no, it's not a basic decision taken by a lawyer and it's not a decision taken by a court because the, it's somebody pushing a button in, in Google's department in most cases, right? So it's not a court. It's a machine. 
And the question that I have now, and I would like to invite you to think about that somewhere, having a glass of beer in your hand later this day, today, or a glass of wine in this area here, is whether this is a good outcome, whether this is something we really want to happen at the moment, that a private company like Google is flooded by requests from all kinds of people asking them to delete information and putting Google into the, uh, the situation to act just like a judge there, whether this is a legitimate case or not. Right? This is one of the outcomes of this Google versus uh, Gonzalez case. And it's possibly one example of my hypothesis that we have a kind of broken law situation there. Let me come up with a second example. You might remember when you saw this film, 1984, won't be like 1984, and what I said about that, that the German Constitutional Court came up with this idea of informational self-determination, so that it should be the person whose data is processed who should be in the position to decide what happens with this data. And there, there's, this is a very, very old legal idea. Uh, uh, this is the Latin saying of it. If you don't have anything to say, say it in Latin. Volenti non fit in iuria. Yeah? So a person agreeing, the, or if, if you do something to a person who agrees, you don't do any harm to that person. Right? If somebody agrees, then the, uh, the situation is okay. And this is, in a way, the idea behind the idea of informational self-determination, and this is the idea behind the idea of informed consent in data protection. If you are properly informed, and if you agree, then everything is fine. The problem now is that also this concept does not really work in a world uh, like ours today, because the world like ours today looks like this here, this is, um, this is a website called Patients Like Me. Ever, ever heard about that, Patients Like Me? Anybody actively using this? Yeah? No? Okay, just reading, right? Okay, which is a good idea to read and not to post. But the, the idea behind it is very interesting in my view. The idea behind Patients Like Me is about sharing. You should be able to share your information about your disease because it should help other patients and it should help research to get a better knowledge about what you have and it might have an impact on your personal diagnosis. So it's about sharing information. And you, nobody is forced to do this, so you can decide whether you want or you don't want to participate. What you get out of it is, if you participate, is you do something for the good, right? So you help others possibly to invent something and you get something for yourself because you find others who have the same problem. And this is how it looks like then, right? So this is, this is a story about Edward. Edward 56, this is a pseudonym. And uh, the forum I'm in here at the moment has something to do with bipolar disorder. And what we see is a picture, an image of Edward and, what, and his personal story here, right? And it's a very personal, personal story. Edward tells something about his uh, personal history starting that he was sexually abused when he was six and that since then he suffers from bipolar disorder. Everybody registering on patients like me can read this. And everybody reading this can see Edward. And can start digging into Edward's story and history because, of course, this is not the only uh, entry that Edward made on this forum. And he's not, he does not only suffer from bipolar disorder, he has all kinds of other um, psychological and psychiatric uh, issues, and all of them are in detail explained by Edward. Or you can do something like this. This is another example. Um, 23andMe.com, which is a, another service dealing with sharing. What you do there is that you send them a little probe of your salvia, and what you receive from them is a DNA analysis of your, of your genes. Um, and all these, um, all these uh, services 
uh, are based on informed consent. So you agree on this. Edward agrees on this. And he has agreed on this because it's quite explicitly mentioned in the terms and conditions of patients like me, what they do with the information. And nobody reads this, right? Nobody reads terms and conditions because nobody wants to see this. Everybody wants to use patients like me. So I need to read this because this is part of my job. So I read the patients and me um, terms and conditions. And what you read there is members should expect that every piece of information they submit, except for something they call restricted data, which is another story to tell, may be shared with the communities, other patients, and partners. So in short, if Edward receives this for free, Edward is the product. The business model is selling Edward. Patients like me shares data in individual and aggregated format to partners and other third parties for use in scientific research and market research. When selling this information, patient like me removes members restricted data, which is Edward's real name, but nobody needs his real name because you have the image and you have the, his history and you have his, where he lives and so on, so you easily re-identify Edward for ed obvious reasons removes members restricted data to reduce the likelihood of re-identification prior to sharing information. Reduce the likelihood. That's a good, that's a good uh, description of what's happening, right? It's, it's no elimination of the likelihood. It's a reduction of the likelihood. So everybody can read this. And not only patients like me, if you have a variable like Fitbit or something similar, you may expect that the same thing is in the terms and conditions. This is now uh, the Fitbit example. So whenever it comes to um, health-related personal information collected by variables, the same scenario like in Edward's case applies. I, I'm not aware of any variable that does not have similar terms and conditions. And this is the problem. This was a joke on the 1st of April, 2010 a, a computer game seller changed its terms and conditions. Yes, go ahead. Yes. 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 Actually, they do sell it without, they buy with telling you because it's somewhere in their terms and condition in the contract that you signed. Yeah, that's, that's the point that I want to make. Legally speaking, it's probably it's legal, right? Pro, pro, I think it's, pro, so they, they do have a very hard argument that it's legal because they have it very explicitly mentioned in their terms and conditions, what they do, and you have explicitly agreed to them. So it's an informed consent thing, right? The question then is, is this informed consent? And this is what I want to stress at the moment, exactly, right? So is it legal that AdWords data may be sold to everybody? Is it legal that my DNA data may be sold to everybody? If I have agreed to this, without, or if I could have agreed to this, uh, by reading and accepting the terms and conditions. So this is the answer, right? So on the 1st of April 2010, this computer game manufacturer changed its terms and conditions. And what they did was that they wrote into their terms and conditions, if you buy our product today, you agree to grant us a non-transferable option to claim for now and forevermore your immortal soul. So you sell your soul. And somewhere in a later part of this terms and conditions, they also said, if you do not agree, please let us know, and you will get a $10 voucher for letting us know, okay? And what happened on that day was 7,500 soul souls and less than 10 vouchers, right? Wow. So that's the problem, right? That's the problem. And another example uh, on this looks like this. I mean, people know this, right? And this problem. This is um, an, a website I like very much uh, for uh, some cynical entries they sometimes have. If you read this here, which is about the cookie policy they have, who is not bored by these stupid cookie uh, information pieces? 
so what they write there is we have updated our privacy policy now, no, not that you care, you can read it or click it to get rid of this annoying box and carry on as before and you can react by whatever, right? <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the problem, right? So informed consent is, I would call it challenged. It's, you can also call it um, a, a hypothesis that never comes through. And the in interesting question then is whether or not the consumer, you or me, Edward, needs to be protected from our informational self-determination, which was the starting point in 1983, right? Informational self-determination. Are we in a world today that is so complex that we are no longer in the position to do this on our own? Okay, third example, last example. The world has also become much more complex when it comes to the security parts of our world, right? So th this is one, one story, unfortunately in German, um, that, that made me sleep a little, a little bit more sleepless than usual some weeks ago, um, mentioning that uh, in a German um, atomic power plant, there was a virus detected, a computer virus detected in a German um, atom atomic power plant. Uh, you, in a, some days later you read, it's, it's not really important, it was not really a security uh, a failure there, blah, 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 all kinds of, um, of uh, distracting messages later. However, just let's just, just try to understand what that means, right? After 30 years of legislation on data protection and privacy and computer security, that a story like this one can be published. And it's not the only story. I mean, you have all kinds of uh, security-related stories like this one here, that one-third of the German companies is affected by ransomware. Actually, I had this in my department yesterday when I came here. Right when I, when I left my office, the last phone call I received was from our computer security department that a machine of one of my staff members was effect, infected by ransomware. Um, so I'm, I'm not the only one, it's about one third of the German companies uh, dealing with this. And you find all kinds of similar stories. This is a nice one here. That's an American hospital affected by ransomware needing to shut down its, com its, com its complete computer infrastructure and then needing to pay $17,000 in order to get their machines up again, right? So we are living in a world today where computers working in power plants or in hospitals are infected by dangerous programs, although we, of course, have all kinds of legislation trying to help us in evading situations like that one. Oh. And there is so much legislation on this, computer security issues, without any real impact. Just one example for this last uh, hypothesis is this one here. Eighty million dollars stolen from a central bank somewhere because the router was not properly uh, configured and the firewall was not up to date. I mean, not sure whether this is true, but let's imagine that it's true, right? So the, the, the idea is, the idea is uh, very, very simple technical issues, constantly repeated uh, in 30 years, not solved, although we have all kinds of legal arguments trying to steer and to control this situation. And my question now, at the end of this presentation, I could go much more into detail in any of those three examples, so just to uh, mention this um, one last time, um, I could go into more details, but all of them have in common that the problem started somewhere in 1983, 1984, and more than 30 years later, it turns out that the situation is much more complex than expected. Um, I would really like you to think about how a legal system, how the law should react on this. One last information on this. Um, when it comes to the legal situation, 2016 will be a date nearly as important as 1984 
because what happened in 2016, what it, if, at least from a European perspective, because what happened in 2016 was that the European legislator came up with a new fundamental piece of legislation, which is the regulation on general data, the general regulation on data protection, a regulation from the European legislator trying to solve most of the issues that I mentioned here. And as I try to make an argument out of, again, failing, right? So my, my hypothesis, this is probably why I was called subversive at, uh, when I was uh, introduced here today. My hypothesis would be, this is the same story again. It's again a story of failure. Also, this general data protection regulation will fail for reasons that have something to do with the technical, social, and economic development of the internet. Thank you very much. I'm very much looking um, forward to hearing your comments and questions now. If you should happen to have questions that you don't want to ask in public, feel free to write me an email or a tweet. Thank you very much. Please. Yes. So what uh, I want to ask is, why can't you input the system decide what the company can ask and what it can ask? For example, the technical piece that we're going to try it. Mm -hmm. So a company cannot write an agreement that says that, okay, we can actually uh, distribute this kind of information uh, on the web. So if this is possible, for example, if we can make a mutual uh, agreement uh, that uh, both users and the company are agreed to follow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the first point I would like to make is I would really not agree on that any medical information, that, that we might still expect that any medical information may be anonymous. I don't think that this is true any longer. Everything is personal, right? And everything is more and more getting personal. So that's the first point. The second point, in, in, in the traditional understanding, such an agreement would be perfectly legal provided that the user is properly informed and that the consent that he gives is freely given. So if the user is properly informed and the consent is freely given, so there is no issue of pressure on the user, then there shouldn't be a problem. So that's the basic thing, right? So this is, this is the basic argument of Google, by the way. Whenever it comes to any privacy problem, the first argument Google and Facebook and others make is we put the user in control the user knows what he or she is doing, and he or she can agree to this. And if he or she agreed, there's no problem. Right? This is a very strong argument because it's a very old argument, right? It's not an IT argument. The problem now is, and there the point is getting more and more challenging, is is the user really voluntarily agreeing to this? Or is the user more in a situation where he faces a take it or leave it scenario? And there is no leave it option because leave it means leave the world, right? So this is, this is one, I mean, my, my, my daughter is 14 now if, and, and she's completely bored by her old father constantly arguing about privacy, right? So this is something she really uh, finds disgusting. But if I came up with an argument on a Sunday morning saying, I don't like the Snapchat privacy policy so please leave Snapchat, and I ask you to leave Snapchat because it's dangerous. She would think that I'm completely crazy, right? I mean, this would be unacceptable because it would mean that I would ask her to leave her social environment. So there is no way to ask her to leave, right? And if this is true, then the, the outcome of this would be, okay, so then informed consent is probably not the best tool we have, right? So then the legislator, the legislator needs to take the standpoint 
I allow this kind of agreement and I don't allow this kind of agreement. The problem with this is this is not very much in line with how we organize our lives and how we organize our economy because it's a kind of super state control that many people don't like right? for political and ethical and, and, and social reasons. And I don't, know, I don't know the answer. An answer that is given by many on this would be, this is not really a computer problem. It's a, comp it's a problem of antitrust law. It's a problem that uh, the companies are so strong that they are able to make this take it or leave it, leave it, leave it choice a de facto standard. That might be true, right? So we are, it's true, we have Google and we have Apple and we have all those very strong players um, with 90 or more percent of market share. Uh, but I don't think that antitrust law will solve the situation because I think it's, it's, it's part of the, of, the, of the whole design of the internet that when you are the first mover, you are getting so strong so quickly that there will always be one market monopoly player in the game. And if this is true, then antitrust law is again not really the solution. So I don't know the answer. <laughs> Why do we? Yeah. When you haven't signed an agreement. Well, no. Uh, according to the to the again according to the traditional European understanding, informed consent may be revoked, and if it's revoked then the legal basis for the processing disappears. This is another idea of disinformation and self-determination. Again, is this true? Should that be true? Right? Should I be in the position to revoke my informed consent for this, for this screening here now? Right? Because, I mean, this university has invested quite significantly for bringing me here, for the infrastructure that is used here. They will put this somewhere on the internet. People will like to see this, blah, 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 blah. Should I be in the position to say, I don't care? I don't want it any longer. I don't care. Put it away. What would you think? Do, should I have that right? Should I have that right? Give me an answer. Should I have that right? No. No? <laughs> huh? Huh? You must have the right to revoke the agreement. Should I? No, Seriously? Uh, yes, to be here. And I have agreed, I have also explicitly agreed to be uh, somewhere recorded, right? But perhaps I find out tomorrow that I'm no longer of the opinion that I make here and that this is not really good to have it on the internet because there's something stupid in my argument, right? Should I then have the right to revoke this? Or should they have the right to say, listen, we have invested into this, we have, we have paid you for this, there are millions of people outside who are really interested in your presentation, millions trying to see this and they are no longer able to do so, right? So, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's not only a US idea, it's also a European idea in a way, right? So, this, as I said, informed consent can be revoked also in Europe, right? So, if I, if I, if I, if I follow the doctrine very closely, the argument would be, the legal basis for this being recorded is my informed consent. If I revoke my informed consent, the legal basis disappears. Please put this offline. End of story. Right? I'm not that sure whether this is still an appropriate answer. I would have another question. I mean, when I buy an electronic gadget, yes. then uh, even if I'm fully informed about what it does, the company who sells me that electronic gadget is not allowed to do anything. For example, it has to within certain ranges of uh, safety of that device. Yeah. Wouldn't it be possible to, I, I, I know it would be a very different problem, but it's also sort of difficult for electronic gadgets to have rules about the electronic safety. Yes. Would it be really very much different to have uh, corresponding rules that uh, would be verified by an HP like my HP or something like that? for kind of uh, uh, consent rules? No, that would be an interesting idea. I think that would be an interesting idea to follow, to have some kind of uh, product safety ideas when it comes to privacy, right? 
Um, the, sorry? Yes. Yes, I mean, there are examples for this. Um, and I think it would be an interesting idea. The pro there are, but there are two problems. The first one, or three problems, possibly. The first one would be, who is the institution really controlling this? Uh, should that be a state authority? Or is it something that is, uh, that, that, that is developed by the market? Right? Uh, if, it, if it should be a state authority, then it would be very expensive, and it would be very slow, and all the administrative burdens would come with this. Uh, so that would be the first thing. The second thing is, as the development is so quick, that's different from a gadget, right? I mean, electricity is something quite well known and that the dangers come out of this, blah, blah, it's 100 years old. When it comes to, to software and internet and social developments, the development is so quick that millions of people have started to use it before anybody has really understood what's going on, right? So it's, it's a little bit of speed and first mover problem. And the third problem is an ethical one which is where exactly do we draw the distinction between informational self-determination, so everybody should have the right to voluntarily agree on anything, and where do we say that we no longer accept this because it's so dangerous? So where exactly is the line? And this is something which is a very, I mean, this, this, is, this is something where, that you constantly see in the law uh, in very different areas that, uh, that the answer on this question changes in history. So to give you, uh, to give you one example on this, um, when, it comes to, when it comes to suicide, sh should it be legal to conclude a contract that I help a person to commit suicide? Right? Or should it be legal to conclude a contract about prostitution? That would be another example. And you could argue in both cases, of course this should be perfectly legal, because everybody agrees and everybody is free in agreeing, and th this is nothing where society should have an, an eye on. And on the other hand, you could also argue, well, suicide is something which is dangerous, and prostitution is something where there is no free will, blah, 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 blah. So society should have an eye on this. And society should tell what is allowed and what is not allowed. And the more liberal you are, the less positive you are about states invent, uh, trying to steer this development. And I'm not sure whether we would find, even in this room here, a common opinion on this, where to draw the line. And the more complex society gets, and the more fragmented societies get, the more difficult this no, gets. Uh, common agreement on prostitution either. Indeed, or right. On uh, indeed, absolutely. So there is no, com and, and there are different answers, and they change, they constantly change. But it's, I mean, uh, uh, legal answers on suicide change in 30 years, which is not really, I mean, it's a problem for the people affected, but from a societal point of view, it's not really a problem because if, if this moves slowly. When it comes to the internet, this is a problem because 30 years of the internet is a completely new world, right? So I. I, I support the idea, and I think it's a good way to go, but I'm reluctant in, in believing that it will solve everything. Right? Please. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So my, I, if I had a solution, I would sell the solution and I wouldn't stand here, right? So my, 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 my solution would be, or my, my very basic idea about solutions would be debates like this one here, right? So start, start thinking together about what to do. And my second solution would be, uh, it's the economy stupid, so there need to be money-related incentive to make it more attractive to follow basic values. And the third answer would be, 
the answer to the machine is in the machine. So we need to have more uh, privacy-friendly solutions in the technology we use, uh, and, it's, uh, and no longer try to, to make people read 50 pages of terms and conditions that nobody reads. There should be a technological support in, um, in, in making use of these uh, uh, choices that we have. So debate, economy, technology, and then at the very last point, law. And in Europe, we do it the other way around. We start with the law, and we forget the rest. Yes. For yes. Like, is it the lawmakers or the government that forces the economy that is trying to build up based on these privacy issues and trying to make a business out of mm -hmm. protecting the work and out of this, this whole status of making a technology more secure, then, then how can we expect that the market will regulate that? Yeah. I don't know. I, I think. I mean. I, d I don't think that this was a very wise decision. Um, uh, however, there are. So I don't support the decision, right? However, there are arguments to make, which are very fundamental arguments, which are, in particular, in this case, um, uh, we are not only talking about privacy. We are also talking about physical security. On the other hand, and uh, citizens do not only have a right to privacy; they also have a right to be protected physically by the state from being killed. Um, and the argument would be this could be at least of the same importance, if not more important, and therefore there might be cases where uh, states might therefore be allowed to breach privacy. That, that's the argument in a nutshell. Uh, as I said, I don't follow it, um, in particular not in this case. Um, but it's an argument that we need to uh, deal with when it comes to everything which has to do with computer security. The question behind this is, do we accept that terrorism might happen because we find it important enough that everybody has a right to privacy that is absolute? That's the question. So how many deaths do we accept? Right? How many would you accept? Yeah. You see? OK. I don't know. I don't know. Right? It depends, right? It depends, right? So it depends. It depends, right? Yeah. And it's also very complex. And it's also very complex because nobody knows what will happen tomorrow, right? You don't know, right? It could be, it could be that the situation changes completely tomorrow um, uh, from a technological point of view, but also from a social point of view. I think if, if something serious happens during the European Championship in, in Paris, serious from a terrorism point, terroristic point of view, then I think the political answer would be very different than when nothing happens. And nobody knows today, right? <laughs> Are there basic values? Uh, you mean for me personally or in Europe? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I actually, I don't know whether I get the question right. I, I think from a Europe, uh, if, if the question is whether the European legislation knows basic values, then I would say yes, they, they are basic values. One of them is dignity, another one would be autonomy, a third one would be some kind of freedom, I would say, right? so there are basic values. And I also personally share them, I would say, right? So this, this is not the problem. But the understanding, of those values. The, un the understanding? I think this, the, the understanding changes. The understanding changes. And the understanding is different from different points of view in the society. 
And it's a political and finally a legal process to outbalance those differences. And this is what happens in every interesting legal case ending somewhere at the constitutional court or even a civil court to outbalance those values. So instead of thinking about the first and which one to read the right law, how do you teach kids to think about using words that can easily be done of your extra push or the job? Well, I think it's not, I, I, there's no contradiction between this. I think it's both, both parts are important. But the legal part is also important because the legal part is the only instrument that we have where we act in a democratic way, right? So we can discuss this and a majority finally decides, which is different in the technological world, right? In the technological world, something is produced and something is bought and it's not, there is no debate about it, right? So if, if something is put into a technological standard, the decision to make is whether is it bought or is it not bought? Does it work or does it not work? And that's very different from law because in law we have a debate and at the end we have somebody saying yes and somebody saying no and there's a majority and that can be changed. That makes it, that makes it possibly a more powerful or more, in some cases a more useful instrument. I have a brother 14 years old. Mm -hmm. She's not going to go. She's not going to buy it? To both. To both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to vote, yes, uh, to vote, I'm sorry, to vote. Uh, yes, okay, okay, she will vote in two or four years. And <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really have a, a question, I was only actually doing the discussion, so it was about me about um, about the company, so it only gave it for a certain data and you were convinced they were, but the, the problem is not for you, so the way for you to decide, okay, I revoke my top 10, um, I, don't, I no longer want my data to show up, Indeed, yeah. For example, on Facebook, they have a very difficult setup of serving all of the world. And when I want to uh, delete my Facebook account, it should say I revoke my top 10 because they did. Mm -hmm. It's very hard for Facebook to identify my personal data on all their servers and then delete it. Indeed. So um, while they can no longer display my public profile, they will probably not be able to uh, influence the friendship score that they calculate for all my data. Yes. And there's totally no way for True, fair enough, true. And the answer to this is, uh, two answers. The first one is, uh, there is a famous case about this, in particular dealing with Facebook. It's the Max Schrems case. Max Schrems, an Austrian law student, who sued Facebook because he argued that Facebook had not deleted uh, personal information relating to him. And Facebook ended by saying, well, we can't, right? Exactly your argument. And the court said, we don't care. It's a fundamental right to make it enforceable because it's a fundamental right, full stop, period, right? Uh, so change your business model. Um, I, I don't know whether this is the appropriate answer, uh, but I do know that under the given legal uh, scenario, it's the right answer. It's, uh, it's the answer coming out of the law. And I don't know whether we should really uh, follow such a kind of slippery slope argument that you make, which is let's make something dangerous enough so that we can no longer change the situation and then the law needs to be revoked because we can't change the situation. That, that is something which helps major players in the market because they, can, they are in the situation to change the situation. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think the problem is Yeah, so this is the problem, of, absolutely. That's a problem of transparency, uh, which is another huge issue. I'm completely with you, right? And the answer to this would be, well, there are data protection authorities who should be uh, in the position to look into this. Uh, w and, and the answer to this answer would be, they can't. Because it's a state authority and they are, all of them are 
um, are completely understaffed and underpaid and 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 so it does it do, this part also doesn't work I agree Yes. Yeah, but the precondition for this would be that if you started with this today, that would be something that would be uh, that would change your business model. So it would need to be important to you, right? But I would assume that it would not be important to you, right? It, it's cheaper not to follow the law, in many cases, right? So if you are if you are uh, financially put, uh, able not to follow the law, you do not necessarily follow the law. There is no intrinsic value in following the law. Right? It's, it's, it's a question. Yeah, for you personally, it might be, right? So, I mean, it, and it's, it might also be a very rational choice, right? And there, there are very good ethical reasons, but when it comes to, to a different shareholder company from a different legal environment, not necessarily sharing your values, the situation gets very, very foggy very quickly. <clears throat> I think that's a good statement for the okay. end. It's uh, complex and yeah, it depends. And indeed. But what is not complex is uh, thank you very, very much for yeah. an excellent talk. And uh, you see there was a lot of interest. Thank you. A tiny token of appreciation thank for you. coming here. Uh, thank you. I hope we have you back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. There's a, there's a German band that I want to recommend, Die Toten Hosen, right? So another one. And they have a song which is called No Alcohol is No Solution Either, right? So <laughs> thank you for this. <laughs>